Welcome to the National Baseball Hall of Fame and Museum in Cooperstown, New York. I'm Lindsay Berra, joined by Carlos Pena, former MLB All-Star, and curator Tom Schieber. We're talking about the Hall of Fame Connections episode from the captain to the streak. We've had 3,000 hits, a 33-inning game, the longest consecutive game streak in history. What do you think? Uh, it was a lot of fun. And, <laughs> I'll say and so. <laughs> it was pretty neat stuff. And we brought some out. So we kind of do a little bit of a deep dive. And I thought we'd start off with these Derek Jeter batting gloves. We've got okay. special blue gloves <laughs> that allow you to touch artifacts and make sure they don't get harmed in any way. So if you don't mind putting them on. Are we supposed to spit in Not them like problem. they do the batting gloves? No spitting, Lindsay. <laughs> this is a non-spitting <laughs> museum. I'm glad you said that. I was about to do it. <laughs> These are not any old batting gloves. These are the gloves that Derek Jeter wore when he got his 3,000th career hit. And, you know, he eventually went on to get way more hits, over 400 more hits. He's sixth all time in hits. All time, sixth. Yeah, so take a look at those batting gloves. What do you think? They look pretty new to me. <laughs> exactly. They're, they're, they're very new. Uh, mine, m mine were a lot dirtier than this, a lot sweatier. But look at these. I mean, these are almost intact. I would think that maybe he was wearing these and he was changing them until he got the 3,000 hit and at the end of every game was maybe trying a new pair. That's precisely yeah. what happened. Right? But remember, <laughs> on the, the, when he got his uh, 3,000th hit, that was an incredible game. He went five for five in that game. He kind of did it in style. Of course he did. <laughs> of course, everything he did, for some reason, it just seemed like there was some divine intervention. I mean, that was Derek Jeter. I would say, though, if I had gone five for five and gotten my 3,000th hit, I would have been using these gloves <laughs> until they ran out of hits, for sure. Well, it, he, he did OK with different gloves. Uh, don't, don't worry about that. But those are the Jeter gloves from the 3,000th hit. That's awesome. Let me show you another artifact. This is the helmet that Cal Ripken Jr. wore when he broke Lou Gehrig's record for most consecutive games played. So Gehrig had the record of 2130. It's Ripken bad. wore this in game 20, his 2131, and of course, a la Jeter. So, so Jeter, years later, gets, uh, goes five for five for the 3,000th hit, right? Rising to the occasion. That's the, 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 day, the day that uh, Ripken uh, broke Gary's record, he homers, of course. That's what I keep on telling you. I mean, it seems like uh, divine intervention. Baseball lends itself for stuff like that. This is, by the way, another very new looking item of, of baseball equipment. He certainly did not wear <laughs> this for 2,000 games. <laughs> this is very shiny. How often did you change your, your equipment, your helmet, your batting gloves when at, you were at playing? Least, at least every year. I mean, uh, but this one. Did you get hit in the head more than he did? <laughs> <laughs> no, actually, never got hit in the head, thank God. <laughs> But uh, man, the Iron Horse, uh, that is incredible, uh, really. That's one of the records I don't think will ever be broken. Well, it's, it's going to be a long time because I don't think anybody's even close to a couple hundred <laughs> games now, right? <laughs> ever, ever. Right. That's awesome. Now, so this, you were mentioned, this is a really clean helmet. Now, were you a pine tar guy? Were you having a, a gross helmet? It wasn't gross, but it certainly wasn't that clean. A couple of so, slams on the ground, you know, bent. <laughs> <laughs> if, if some, because some of these helmets have the pine tar on them, is that why we're wearing these blue plastic gloves now and not those white cloth ones? That's a great question. Right. So um, we do get artifacts that come our way that aren't necessarily clean, which is great. That's fine. And, um, but if you were to wear the, the old white gloves, which are sort of cloth gloves, the, um, they, one, they can leave some residue behind. They can leave some sort of lint behind. They do have a problem with the stickiness of pine mm -hmm. tars so with bats or helmets, or, uh, that kind of be a problem. But this is also really good because you can get a better feel for what you're holding on to. There's a, there's, it's more tactile. So we're inside museum kind of stuff. <laughs> this is good stuff. Yeah. Now, um, let me give you some other inside museum stuff. I want to talk about Lou Gehrig artifacts that we brought out. And two different artifacts I want to talk about that are uh, really cool, but for a while were really mysterious to us. We couldn't figure out what was going on. Um, the first one I'm going to talk about is this beautiful trophy that was given to Lou Gehrig. Mm. Um, it commemorates his playing 2,130 straight games. And actually, on this plate in front here, it says it's from the Sporting News, which is a longtime sports baseball bible. And it says it's to Lou Gehrig for his consecutive game played streak. And it mentions the beginning and ending dates of the streak. And it says 2,130 straight games. So I was researching this. And I thought, well, it's in the Sporting News. It's, it, it, they made the trophy. They would certainly publicize it in their paper. So I'm looking through the paper, you know, sometime after the streak ended in 1939, and I can't find any information about it. I'm like, what's, why aren't they putting any information there? 
And I, I sort of widened my scope of looking, and finally I ended up finding it in a newspaper in the Sporting News in 1933. Six years so, before the end of the streak. How is that possible? Yeah, wait, 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 wait a second. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm losing it here with, with the math. So how does that even make sense? It right. So how in 1933 did they know that he would have a streak that ends in 1939 on this particular date with this number of games, right? Well, and we saw this in the, uh, in the episode earlier. And the answer is that when they gave him this trophy, they gave it not for his 2130th game. They gave it when he broke the okay. old record. And that was in 1933. He broke Everett Scott's record for most consecutive games played. It was in St. Louis, which is where the Sporting News uh, was published. And so the Sporting News gave him this trophy on that day. But there's no information at the bottom that says, here's when your streak ended. Because they <laughs> don't know yet. Know yeah, that. exactly. Right. So they said, so listen, cool, yeah. when your streak is done, give us a trophy back. We'll finish the engraving. And then you can put it on your mantle. I was going to ask if he got to take it home or if the Sporting News just kept it until it was over. <laughs> no, not only did he get to keep it permanently, and it was eventually donated to us by his widow, Eleanor Garrett. But I don't know if you've, you guys have seen uh, the movie The Pride of the Yankees. Gary Cooper. Gary Cooper, exactly, right. right. So this is, this is a, sort of the bio movie of, of Lou Gehrig. But Eleanor Gehrig was very involved in that movie. And she loaned uh, MGM lots of actual objects from, not props, actual objects from uh, his career for that movie. And in the background, watch the movie again, and in the background, at one point, you see this huge shelf full of trophies. And this very object What's is that? in that movie. But, okay. well, you know, one, one thing I noticed, Lindsay, is that right here at the bottom, the, the font is not the same. Like the, the last line here is not the same as if it's This is why you're a great hitter. You <laughs> see this stuff. And that's exactly right. So, you know, six years later, they couldn't quite mimic the exact font that who knows who did the, the engraving back in 33. So in 1939, they made their best shot, but it does look a little bit different. It yeah, all became clear afterwards. It's worn out on the top, a little more worn out on the top, and then it looks kind of like neater and newer in the bottom. Right. So this is the kind of, like, uh, in-depth research we have to do on these objects because I can't, as a curator, I can't tell the story of an object without really fully understanding it. And I had this very confusing moment when I thought, well, was there a spacecraft that took them in a time capsule? It's a time or? machine, man. <laughs> right. And they don't often come to you with like a Cliff Notes version of where this came from. How difficult is it sometimes to find the provenance of these? Sometimes items? it's really hard. Sometimes it's super easy. Guys, uh, you know, keep track of. Let's say, let's say something came from a ball player. They could keep great track of of uh, everything. I, I went over to Mike Mussina's place uh, to prepare a, an inductee case for him. He has a ton of stuff, and he knows exactly what everything is. Uh, How are you about that? My wife is better at that than I am. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes, like, hey, who do you hit that home run off of? I'm like, eh, I don't remember. So I need your help with that, Tom. So. Okay. All right, great. You know, I know what it Back me. in my grandfather's day, he didn't keep track of anything. He would put his jersey sweaty in the hamper at the end of the season and then had no idea where it, where it came from right. or where it went. Or, and the Yankees evidently used to give those to minor league ball players, so all of his jerseys would just be out playing in Florida somewhere. Yeah, there's some jewels out there that a lot of people don't realize are, are, are great objects. Yeah. The, the other one I want to tell you, also a bit of a mystery, is this letter. And um, take a look at it. It comes from a guy named Harold Habine, who was a doctor at the Mayo Clinic. And it's dated June 19, 1939. And um, it basically says to whom it may concern. Oh, wow. And what's on there is the diagnosis. It, you know, Lou Gehrig went to the Mayo Clinic, wow. and after about a week of, of tests, they came back and they said, here's what you, you've got. Now, this is addressed to That's whom it may concern. This, I just got goosebumps. This yeah. is such a sobering thing because Lou Gehrig over those years thought that he could solve his problems by switching to a lighter bat. He thought he was a little tired. And then to get this, I, mean, this, I can't imagine how crushing this was. Yeah, it immediately it reads, this is to certify that Mr. Lou Gehrig has been under examination. This is unbelievable. Yeah. But here's the interesting thing about this from a museum standpoint. You know, you read it, you basically understand what this is. It's a diagnosis. We don't know who it went to because it says to whom it may concern. It doesn't say to person X or whatever. Yeah. Well, every object that you're looking at here, and what we looked in our other episode, um, they all have what's called an accession number. That is a unique number that allows us to track objects. So I look up the accession number, and it's affixed to this, 
and I can find out information about it. It's like a social security number. You know, it gives us information. Well, this object was in our collection, and there was no accession number on it, which means we didn't know how we got it, or who gave it to us, or what the background was. So we knew some information, but we had lost that information. Every museum has a situation. It's called found in collection, mm -hmm. and you deal with it. Well, I decided I want to put this on exhibit in a different exhibit at one point, and I thought, I've I got to figure this out. I mean, we can figure this out, right? So, and in hindsight, it's like very obvious, but we have a wonderful scrapbook that was kept by Eleanor Gary. She was a huge scrapbooker. And the scrapbook, I, I suddenly realized, oh, maybe this came from that scrapbook. So I, and the scrapbook's in chronological order. It's a wonderful thing about scrapbooks. It, it's a little <laughs> timeline. So I went to the area around June 19th, 1939, and I found a blank space in the scrapbook. And actually, if you looked really closely, you could see where there's like, almost like a reverse shadow. There used to okay. be something there. So I took this piece of paper, and I lay it down, and it fit perfectly. And I thought, ah, oh, you're a genius. You figured this out, <laughs> right? And then I did that for about half a second. And then it, I immediately realized what? It's an 8 and a half by 11 piece of paper. <laughs> <laughs> Every single paper fits that scrapbook. So uh, then I felt not so good. But then I turned over this paper, because it used to be glued in the scrapbook. And there's swirl marks of glue that Eleanor applied herself. Those were unique. That's not like 8 and a mm -hmm. half by 11. Those were unique. And I looked, and they were a perf perfect reverse image in the scrapbook. And then I knew, no, no, I, I actually. Was a match. What's also amazing about that is it barely looks like it's ever been folded, that piece of paper. It's, it's an incredible shape. Right. So you can see the fold marks, but, but it's it, so it was, it, so that's how it came to her. So now we know more information about this, right? Now it's not just to any to whom it may concern. This was given to the Gehrigs. I mean, it's cool, hmm. independent about that, but this makes it doubly cool that this is the official um, diagnosis that was given to the Gehrig's. Wow, himself. that's amazing. So this is the kind of sort of, um, I like to call it CSI Cooperstown that we do. Yeah, I mean, you do you an know. investigation, almost like a treasure hunt, really. Right, right. And you know what? That's what we do at this museum is we share these treasures. We share information about them to engage people and get people interested and excited. Thank you so much for sharing all these Cooperstown treasures with us today. We hope you've enjoyed this episode of our Hall of Fame Connection series. If you'd like to learn more about the people, places, and artifacts featured in this video, go to baseballhall.org, where you can plan your visit to the National Baseball Hall of Fame and Museum in Cooperstown, New York, and discover your own connections to the game. Thanks for watching. For more incredible stories, check out our Hall of Fame Connection series. And don't forget to subscribe. Placada!